Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the sixth annual SAM ultrasound debate. Uh, apparently, I was too aggressive last year, so I was actually kicked out of one of the speaking roles. Um, but we have a great team here set. We're going to be talking about uh, contrast use in emergency ultrasounds, and then our second topic is going to be should handheld ultrasounds replace CARP-based systems in emergency departments. So I'm going to turn it over to Jason Namora. Hi, I'm Jason Namora from Christiana Care in Delaware. Uh, we're going to talk about contrast. I'm doing the pro side. And remember, we all have the different views and we represent different sides of the argument here today, but we all sort of believe in similar things. Most times, sometimes, and maybe not always. All right, so no disclosures. I'm doing the pro discussion for contrast. As a show of hands, how many people are using contrast or contrast enhanced ultrasound now in their ED? Anybody working on getting it? Anybody ever sneak into the storeroom and just steal some vials and not tell anyone and just, just me? No, okay. So one of the things is we like contrast. Contrast works great, bubbles for everyone, right? So when we talk about it in the use of trauma, We've been doing the FAST since 1970, right? When it was first used across overseas, and then in the 90s we adopted it in the U.S. It's made into the ACR uh, uh, documentation. For hypotensive trauma patients, it's one of the primary studies. It's ranked very high in their appropriateness guidelines. We've also had collaboration with IUM where we have the um, practice guideline for the FAST. It makes it into JAMA about acute blunt abdominal injury. And then in the very bottom, ultrasound is one of the test characteristics that they looked at that FAST is better than your labs. The sensitivity and specificity drop when they adjust for publication bias, but it still performs better than the labs. And we, most of us all draw labs as part of our trauma protocol, and the ultrasound does better, but there are limitations, right? And I can show you that right there. Recently, the Cochrane Library updated their FAST guideline in 2018. They had 34 studies, over 8,000 patients. Sensitivity of 74%, specificity of 96%. And they said, it's great. But they're like, in high-income countries, we don't know if the FAST is that useful because if they're unstable, you can probably make them stable. So why don't you just make them stable and then CAT scan them? Like, you probably shouldn't take unstable patients to the OR because you should just stabilize them first, which is sort of not quite right. But in the stable patient, FAST kind of drops down to appropriateness guidelines. There's better imaging that you can do. And the reason we have this discussion is back from this old paper way back when, the Not So Fast study with um, Dr. Miller and his friends, where they looked at injuries that you can miss in the fast. And this is always the thing that comes back to us and always comes up in the discussions with our trauma teams and our surgeons and our radiologists, that there are things you can miss in the fast exam, right? So in that study, the Not So Fast exam, or the Not So Fast study, the things that they were missing were all solid organ injuries. And we made the argument that most of these are not operative injuries. We're going to watch them. We may repeat labs. We may keep them in observation period in an OBS unit or maybe even just in the ED. They may or may not get a repeat scan. But they're sort of non-operative injuries and they're solid organ injuries. And so we've been using the FAST for many, many years, for decades. The sensitivity is pretty good. The specificity is pretty good, especially in an unstable patient. But we sort of hit that ceiling where there are still things we're not seeing, not catching. And some of our consultants and some of our partners are sometimes concerned about that. And that's where contrast comes in. So contrast for ultrasound is not like CT contrast, right? It's not a, a radiopaque dye. It is air or another inert gas surrounded in a microlipid bubble, which this has come from, uh, adapted from a slide from a study, but the image is from Mayo, thankfully, because they have much better graphic artists than we do at Christiana, as in we have none. And then the shell is usually a lipid layer. Sometimes it's a galacto shell from some other things. Most commonly in the US, you're going to hear about sulfur hexafluoride microlipid A, which is under the brand name of Lumason. And then when you have risks with this, you do have something, an allergic type or uh, anaphylactic type reaction called a CARPA reaction, the contrast associated uh, release reaction. It's pretty low, right? 0.001%. So probably less than handing out penicillin. And we hand that stuff out like candy and don't think twice. Right? So allergic reactions, very minimal. Pregnancy category, they sort of removed that, right? But under the old format, this was classified as a category B uh, for pregnancy. And just as a reminder, Tylenol is category C. 
So pretty safe medication. Should we use it? Well, Europe says we should back from 2008. So now that it's 2019, maybe we'll kind of get on the bandwagon here. So the European Federation of Societies for Ultrasound and Medicine and Biology have their guideline from 20, 2008. Contrast ultrasound is recommended in addition to the FAST in the evaluation of traumatic parenchymal injuries to liver, spleen, and kidney. So you're looking for those solid organ injuries. Those things that the FAST has always been criticized about missing, contrast sort of fills in that role. Right? What about kids? Well, they also had a statement on that. And the sensitivity, it's a sensitive test, it's radiation-free, and it's repeatable. And they flag it as child-friendly imaging, meaning it's, I'm not strapping the kid to a gantry in a cold room and you know, yelling at them to stop crying and hold still while I irradiate them. So no circulation at all in the hematomas or lacerations unless there's ongoing bleeding. And you can find it in all circulatory phases of your solid organs. So pretty easy to use, fairly common, and recommended in Europe and used across everywhere but the US because we were a little late to adoption because of some FDA regulations. So except in the very early phases where you have a little bit of change and that initial enhancement, you should be able to see injuries, right? And this is the key part where they say the very first part of arterial phase, right? We're talking seconds. So this is a very fast study to get the contrast loaded, to get that circulating, to get those images and evaluate the organs. The scanning through the organs takes a little longer, but the enhancements very quickly. So this can be done easily in the trauma bay. Right? This is a classic contrast image. You're going to have your dual screen, so you're going to have your grayscale image so you can orient yourself. Your contrast image, which looks horrible because there's no contrast yet. And then you inject some contrast and you start to see the bubble starting to fill through the vasculature and the kidney. You see the kidney light up, right? The contrast remains intravascular, so the parenchyma of the kidney lights up very easily. Easy to see, right? You compare it to your grayscale image. The collecting system does not light up because none of it gets extruded through the kidney. It just stays intravascularly. You can look at your liver. As your liver starts to highlight, you see all those vessels starting to highlight in the parenchyma. A little uneven right now, but it starts to homogenize. And then we can see the homogenous image where our whole liver is enhanced. And we're looking for any injuries in there, and we're not really seeing any. You do have your grayscale image, so you can correlate where the bowel gas is and your echo dropout. When you add contrast to the FAST, your sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value all go up. They all go into the high 90s. Right? What about pediatric? Because that's the other category where we do have some limitations in the FAST in addition to the adults. And in that case, their sensitivity, specificity, and everything else also improved greatly. Now, granted, this was a much smaller study, but it did much better. For injuries to the liver, spleen, and kidney, ultrasound, okay. You see it, it's there, right? Positive predictive is good. But with contrast, it pops into the high 90s, much better. And the argument becomes, well, if I'm taking them to CT anyway, do I need to contrast them? with contrast ultrasound. So this was really focused more on cancer and tumors, but there is a move in radiology that if you can't get contrast or you shouldn't get contrast for whatever reason, maybe contrast enhanced ultrasound performs better than a non-contrast CT for evaluation of these things. If you are looking to start, this is a good article to start with. It's a nice discussion about the indications, descriptions, and methodology of doing contrast studies. They show you correlation between non-enhanced ultrasound, CT images, and um, contrast images. And then there's the PubMed ID number if you guys ever want to pull that up so it's easy to find to make it easier. All right? The other problem is contrast is dynamic imaging with ultrasound, right? CT is static imaging. So if I flash that kidney or that spleen, and you see that filling, right? Remember, the spleen has red and white pulp, so that's going to enhance a little differently over time. So you can see that zebra effect in your spleen, right? We see that on CT all the time. Ma could be contrast mixing, may have laceration, unsure, don't know, recat scan, right? If I have ultrasound, and I'm looking, and I have that flow void there, right about there, where you see that area where there's no filling and that little defect, the question is, is that actually a laceration or not? And so I just watch it for a little bit, and I go right back, and when I image it later, it fills in. So that's just the difference between the red and the white pulp. That's that zebra mixing, just like you see on CT, except I don't have to re-CAT scan them. I don't have to re-inject them. I just wait a couple seconds and just keep imaging. Right? And then if it's missed time, like the contrast cleared, your CT is not going to be helpful. My contrast cleared. I just inject a little bit more. 
right? That's the benefit of dynamic imaging. You can adjust what you're doing based on what's going on and what the images you see. CT, unfortunately, is a very static image. But you can see lacerations in the spleen here where we have that blunt injury. This is a patient where we had five patients all in a major trauma accident. And this was the least sick person. So there was free fluid, but we kind of evaluated where that free fluid was coming from. So she got contrast in the trauma bay before we took her up to the OR. And she got triage like to the end of the line considering how injured other people were. But the case is we would never have known that. We would have to wait for her after CT. And then I'm just going to speed ahead real quick. You can detect active bleeding. This is a patient who unfortunately had a lot of free fluid. And then you can see the contrast bubbles leaking out into the free fluid around the spleen. You can see a lot of contrast in there. So you can see that there's still active bleeding going on. Not encouraging, uh, since he got CPR and TPA for his big PE. But then after the TPA wore off, you can see that now no longer is there any active bleeding. So that sort of helped triage what we were going to do for him and do his splenectomy before we fully heparinized him for his massive PE. Right. And if there's any questions, you can always get a hold of me. But next up will be our con lecture. All right. Next up is Dr. Dan Theodoro presenting the con sides of contrast ultrasound. I'm Dan Theodoro. I am the uh, Emergency Medicine Point of Care Ultrasound Section Chief at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And I just wanted to thank everybody for thinking of me uh, when we put together this presentation. Uh, I have no formal disclosures, but I do have one. I asked my daughter, I was like, God, I have this debate on contrast agents. She's 13 years old. And I go, how do you think I should win the debate? And she goes, Daddy. Puppies! <clears throat> Jason, Toby, you guys with your vest on and the ponytail, you guys are like little puppies when it comes to contrast and enhanced ultrasound. <laughs> it's so cute. But you got to be careful with puppies because they get into mischief. And sometimes this happens. This guy was like, hey, I got a great idea. Let's put tires like this on a truck and see what happens. That's the same thing that's going on with ultrasound. It's uh, enhanced agents. They seem like great ideas, really good ones. However, they don't go anywhere in the end because, well, you really can only do one or two things, like drive over cars, like this truck. Um, and in the end, you end up parked outside on some lot as uh, just a tourist attraction. That's my theme for this. And I'm going to tell you why in a shorter collection of slides. The first question that everyone has to ask is, are these things safe? Um, apparently pigs die when you give them this stuff. Did you guys know this? <laughs> you saw the bubbles. Those bubbles that open up release agents into the bloodstream. In fact, when they get released, they break up clots. It's a serious thing. And in fact, if you guys don't know the history of this stuff, back in 2008, I believe it was, uh, they gave it, they were just monitoring sort of post-market stuff and 10 people died shortly after receiving these contrast agents. So the FDA put some kind of black label on it. And now you can say, yeah, the FDA did lift the black label after many years, but it's also lifted uh, the label on flying these planes right here, okay? And right now, these planes are grounded because they present probably a similar risk to contrast, <coughs> ultrasound contrast. Okay. Uh, Jason, you said about one in, I think, 10,000. I think that's probably about the risk of flying in a Max Air 737, and yet the planes are grounded right now. Okay, so just because the FDA said it's okay doesn't mean that it is okay. The other issue is the people who died after they got these agents are exactly the type of people as emergency physicians we're going to be giving it to. They were all septic, sick, having shock. Um, granted, they weren't all trauma patients, but it's possible. Here's the other thing I'm worried about, this paper. Residents like this stuff. 
you know what that means? That in their hands, they're going to be squirting it in everybody. And all of a sudden, that like one in 5,000 risk is having every 5,000 ultrasounds. At most of our big shops, that's like one or two a year. Are you kidding me? What are we going to tell the public? Oh, sorry, the FDA said it was OK. They're going to turn around and be like, they also said it was OK to fly on these planes. So we have to be careful before we employ this as a really legitimate imaging method. The other thing is that it's really not that easy. It's not like pressing a picture on your phone and going from color to black and white and vice versa. This is easy, right? I put the filter on my iPhone, and I get this beautiful black and white, and then I put some color on it, and I feel all artistic. When you do ultrasound contrast, it's not easy. This is the methods paper from, uh, the methods language from one of them. I mean, look at this stuff. You take the transducer, then you've got to turn on contrast pulse sequencing, use pulse inversion, harmonic, and energy, blah, 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 blah. That made me think. If I still have to give this lecture, which is, this is how you turn on the ultrasound machine, how in the hell am I going to get my colleagues to use contrast agents with the correct setting and the timing? Okay? It's just, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be really hard. I mean, here I am going, here's the power switch, guys. On this one, it's right here. <clears throat> this stuff takes time, okay? Uh, it sounded like it only took one or two seconds, but as I was reading these papers, I was reminded of my uh, 80s subculture. I used to love um, Boy George and Culture Club, and I was reminded of this song. You can sing along if you know the lyrics. Time won't give me time. Time makes lovers feel like they've got something real. But you and me, we know we got nothing but time. And for you uh, millennials, um, I did put a long time from Lil J reference there. So it just takes a long time. That's what I want you guys to remember. How long? Well, it takes about five to eight minutes to do one of these studies. And that's in experienced hands. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever tried to tell a trauma surgeon, you've got to wait about five or eight minutes before I tell you whether or not this guy's got a liver lack? There's no way they're going to put up with this. It just doesn't translate itself to our environment. Now, Dr. Nomura, he gave a lot of research up here. He put Cochrane up, lots of stuff in German I didn't understand. <laughs> the research on this stuff is like this sign. It's, a just, it's, it's too good to be true. I mean, there were 100% sensitivities. It's like, we're done. Mic drop. This is one of the summary comments from a meta-analysis. It says, in our example, pragmatic design means that physicians are not blind to imaging results during the performance of contrast-enhanced ultrasound, confounding the diagnostic accuracy. And they go on to say, it's interesting to investigate how the presence of the results of other imaging studies can influence the interpretation of contrast-enhanced ultrasound findings. Well, it's like, duh, if the CT is telling me it's positive, I'm probably going to find it with the contrast agents. So what I guess I'm trying to tell you is that the research isn't all there, at least in trauma. There's other applications, too. There's these um, sort of subtle EKG findings. People say, let's put it in, let's give the patient some contrast and see if they have any kind of uh, abnormal squeeze. Well, first of all, if we do that, what's this guy going to do? OK, Mr. <laughs> Speckle, is he in the room? I didn't see him, OK? So this is Reardon. He does a lot of speckle. But he's on to something. You know why he's on to something? Because he's using machine technology, not our naked eye, machine technology to tell us what's going on. And when you use these contrast agents, I mean, you saw Dr. Nomura. He's like, wait for it. Look up here. Uh, I think I kind of see it. I said, I see it now. Do you see it? With the machine, the machine just gives you a graphic representation and tells you whether you got normal function or not. That's the future. It's AI stuff. It's algorithms. Think about it. Right now, that AI stuff automates our gains. Um, it enhances the imaging automatically. It'll turn the machine off if you leave it on. Um, it takes out that judgment feature, which still exists with contrast, whether or not, however, however cool it looks on, on screen. There's some literature out there that, oh, maybe it'll help with triple A detection. Um, you want to get better at AAA detection? Teach people to read AAAs. I don't need contrast to tell me that this is a AAA. And if I did, I would say, I better go talk to Mike Blyvis because he taught me how to read AAAs and I don't know what I'm looking at. Okay? 
This is an oldie buddy, but a goodie, by the way, from North Shore back in the day, eight centimeter AAA, went right to the OR. It was, it's my case zero, so I always play it when I can. What about austere environments? We've heard this, I mean, you heard it in the last presentation. The Cochrane Review says, you know, in austere environments, it might have a role. But here's the thing about austere environments. They don't need contrast-enhanced ultrasound. They need things like potable water. <laughs> if you fix the water problem, we can save a billion people, okay? That's a lot better than spending $100 a vial and giving people with, uh, you know, who don't even have ambulance systems and triage systems contrast-enhanced ultrasound. It's just, it's just not here for us here on, in the West. I'm just going to conclude by saying maybe contrast was sort of behind the times and CT was ahead of the times. If you think about it, in the 80s and 90s, that's when CT sort of came to life. All the studies came out then and all the studies on trauma continue to be on CT. CT gives you tons of advantages that just the contrast won't give you. We didn't talk about deep tissue injury, bowel injury, things like that that uh, CT gives you additional uh, information that contrast-enhanced ultrasound just does not. Maybe if things were different, maybe if contrast-enhanced ultrasound started in the 90s and uh, we were now going through a decade or two of research with it, it might be worth it, but we're just not there yet. So I just want to conclude before we just adapt it all and go for it, we've got to be careful not to create that truck that I showed you. Like, yes, you can do it. Yes, it looks pretty cool at first, but we got to know how and what, whether or not we're going to continue to use it before it just becomes some kind of relic that we just show cool pictures of. Thanks. Good afternoon, thanks for coming. I'm not sure what I watched, stand-up comedy or uh, <laughs> CBS Evening News, <laughs> planes, water. I apologize on behalf of Dan. <laughs> I know that this is not what you came for. <laughs> you thought you were gonna have some evidence-based review literature and he's showing. All right, we'll get started right here. So, um, <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about handheld ultrasound. Obviously, I'm uh, going to be arguing for pro uh, for uh, for using handheld ultrasound, support of handheld ultrasound. So I just want to, before I get started, so how many of you um, have used or are still using handheld ultrasound right now? I don't think we need to debate. It's, it's closed here. So anyway, that's great to see. A lot of people are using um, handheld ultrasound. So let me start with a slide which shows um, all the features which you're all familiar, which makes handheld ultrasound uh, sort of uh, desirable uh, in our clinical practice. So how it's being so small and portable, um, the quality of images and simplicity, all this stuff uh, make it desirable and how they can impact patient outcomes and so on. So let me start with something very simple. Um, I'm sure most of you experience this. You go to the patient's room and you're talking to the patient, and you're like, damn, I should have this ultrasound machine right now. I'll be, I will be scanning while I was talking. So I'm not sure we have 12 machines and I still can't find the machine. I go room to room, I'm looking, I'm sometimes like bending over and looking and people are saying hi huh, under the curtain, things like that. So I can't find the machines. So they're all over the place. You have a, like a, something written right in the hallway, park the machine here. No, that area is generally empty. Ultrasound <laughs> machines are not there. So only if you have the opportunity to take a handheld device and scan the patient as you are taking the history, I think, you know, that probably increases, makes, uh, get you early diagnosis and all the downstream kind of time saving and efficiency and so on. What about this? 
trauma rooms to be like they're now rebuilding, right? Like a big room. Still, we seem like we don't have enough space to squeeze the ultrasound machine there. So what if you have your wireless probe, you walk in there, and you're scanning, and you have TV monitors right there, OK? And you're displaying the anatomy there, and displaying all the pathology, whatever. So fantastic, right? So that's what we need, you know, taking the big cart, you know, rolling in between the patients. And trauma surgeons sometimes love them, sometimes hate them. Uh, then you have to apologize for things. And so only if you have the handheld device, that would make your life easier. Let's move to the inpatient setting. Man, I hated those rounds because no, there was nothing relevant to that given patient. Everything is like going around and around talking. Everybody's like pretending we're interested in what you're saying, but everybody's like, what time I'm going to get the hell out of here? So people are thinking about it, right? This would make it more easier, right? We don't have to talk about things which doesn't exist in this patient. Please. So we're going to get to the point here, right? So, so easy. In fact, the studies have been done, right? So they looked at uh, cardiology fellows, went around and scanned patients uh, with the handheld ultrasound as compared to cart-based systems. And uh, the diagnosis they have arrived at pathology they have found more or less comparable to cart-based systems. Um, same thing they have done on um, medical uh, internal medicine residents. They've scanned people who were admitted to the hospital, and they about 200 patients. So they looked at the same things. How did they change the diagnosis? The number one diagnosis became five, or what are the alternative diagnoses they have found? Again, the data is very comparable to card based systems, uh, highlighting the use of um, um, point of care ultrasound or handheld ultrasound in the uh, inpatient settings. So now nurses. I've been doing ultrasound. There's a lot of literature published, uh, even in the handheld ultrasound world. Uh, they're not only putting IVs, they're looking at the B lines and so on. Uh, actually, when we, we're in the banner healthcare system, RTs actually perform ultrasound, uh, and they are um, somewhere in Phoenix in the bunker. Uh, physicians are watching them perform the ultrasound and give the instructions whether they need to give fluid or not based on the B lines. So uh, uh, definitely handheld ultrasound, because of the simplicity, I think um, RTs or nurses or somebody who doesn't have the same background like us could still use um, handheld, handheld ultrasound. So this is a study we have done in our shop. Essentially, we didn't have dollars to buy a separate ultrasound equipment for the nurses. This actually, uh, my colleague Acuna, Dr. Acuna, presented this morning. So essentially what we did was, um, this was actually, uh, Phillips was generous to give us two machines for a year. So we put out that one, we trained our nurses, we had a program, we certified them after whatever, five, U, five independent IVs and so on. And then we uh, collected the data. So we had about close to what, 420 patients, and then we collected how many times it took them to get the IV using uh, success rate, first pass success rate, and their opinion about what the quality of image uh, looked like on the handheld ultrasound, very promising. And, and because of the data, we actually purchased the systems, and obviously they're affordable. So it really changed how we operate in the ED because of the handheld devices. Training, right? Um, when you compare people who are very experienced uh, versus uh, people who are novices, how does, uh, you know, in terms of diagnosis, making diagnosis or um, recognizing things on handheld ultrasound, are they any different? So this study is a meta-analysis. Uh, about 25 studies uh, they looked at. Uh, essentially, if you look at the operators, either very experienced or even nurses and the novice uh, physicians, um, the data was very comparable in terms of recognizing different pathologies. So handheld ultrasound in most of the studies did well when compared to the card-based systems. Again, this is one another study highlighting the use of uh, handheld ultrasound uh, in medical student education, uh, supporting the use of um, uh, and also in the teaching the medical students. This is the idea we floated to our dean. So we said, you know, what if uh, we do a fundraising or uh, whatever the dollars we have, maybe we should try, and also, instead of giving that stethoscope, maybe we should try this, so an ultrasound probe. So this is work in progress at our institution, see if we could afford to give a probe um, to every medical student. And then we actually tried um, um, to give it to residents and see during the rotation if that actually increases um, the number of ultrasound they performed, uh, uh, competency in that area, uh, in, 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 we told them to do this cardiac, and depending on the probe we gave. So would it do a, would do any, would they be any better at the end of the rotation? Certainly that was the case with this resident when we gave it for two weeks. Uh, he was able to go around and scan, and we have data on this. 
And there are different applications, um, uh, handheld data, ultrasound uh, data published out there. Um, I'll show you a couple here. Uh, this was a study done, patients coming in to emergency department for dyspnea, see if we can arrive at the diagnosis just using the handheld ultrasound. Again, the accuracy in this study was about 90%. So um, again, there are a mix of operators, uh, novice sonographers versus experts. So it really did well uh, in terms of lung ultrasound in this, in this study. Again, the listed there are different sensitivities and specificities for just uh, cardiology, like uh, echocardiac, um, just transthoracic echocardiogram using a, a handheld ultrasound. The numbers are, for today's image quality, I think they're very decent. Um, and these are some of the images I want to show. Um, um, in our shop, when we had handheld ultrasound device, we went around scan. Uh, certainly, you're thinking probably, obviously, this is the lecture. He's going to show the best pictures and so on. Um, certain, we Not only just that, we actually, in this case, I don't know how well you can see here, but uh, there's epiglottis there. So um, you could, we try different applications. And um, obviously, some of us are, uh, have advanced training. We also have like resonance and so on scan. So our success has been, uh, we had really good success in terms of um, diagnosing the pathology, uh, not only in the studies I've shown you, but at our shop as well. Um, one other criticism right now, ASAP has uh, recommendations and so on, is the workflow. Um, we were able to, and I'm sure most of you were, did the same, so we were able to integrate the handheld ultrasound device into our QPAD, so uh, the studies which were done, um, we asked for a feature uh, that they if, if this device gets stolen for some reason, nobody should be able to access. So as soon as you acquire the images, it's cleared from the log. So that, that's, um, uh, that's been accomplished. So we, our workflow, except for filling out the worksheet bedside, everything else is intact using the handheld ultrasound device. And dollars, no brainer. So definitely, it's a big difference uh, in terms of cost. Uh, it's very highly cost effective. Just if you go PubMed, and if you just Google um, PubMed, the handheld ultrasound device, you're going to get many hits. Um, and if you look at the different applications, there are diagnostic, procedural, educational, whatnot. So just if you look at from 2009 through 2019, the last decade, it just exploded. So the number of pubs on the handheld device is just uh, increasing rapidly. So here's a, uh, a picture which shows the data. So it seemed like it started with the cardiology first, and then was in the austere settings. Then we started to adapt. And after that, looks like everybody else, the other specialties are kind of taking off. And the, and the medical education is coming up. And then there's a projected use uh, starting from like 2020 to 2025. So uh, L, this is unstoppable, buddy. I don't know about you, but so it's going to take off. So. Um, and then there are some predictions for this. So by in 2018, about $15 million worth is spent. In 2019, it's projected to boost like by 50% the sales. And by 2023, uh, it's projected to uh, like $400 million sales in handheld device. So it's an uptick. What I really like about a handheld device is when I go to the meeting, come back, some of these guys like are, are not, we had no, like Dan was talking about, don't even know how to turn the power button on in ultrasound machines. They immediately asked me, hey, I want to buy this device. So we have the people who have no clue about ultrasound. Now they want to buy the handheld device. There is this new enthusiasm among the people who've never even touched, or I shouldn't say never, but don't have the desire to scan. They're now motivated to scan because of the handheld device. And I, I believe all the, most of the code cards should have a rapid response team should have them. Um, and I, th I think they will be in the flights, um, even if they crash, uh, uh, Dan. So <laughs> there will be a device in there. Uh, and then I think all the airports and things like that, probably right next to your defibrillator, probably there will be a device pretty soon. So, uh, and the vendors are getting pretty savvy, right? They're integrating software where you can do the tele ultrasound, where you can connect the novices to the experts uh, to provide real time uh, uh, advice for patient care. Pre hospital is pretty, uh, like a lot of stuff is out there being published right now for handheld ultrasound. And then resource limited settings, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to have something they could afford uh, and they can make a big difference in patient care. So, 
Um, and obviously, austere settings, this is easy to carry, uh, you know, which you can hook it up to your own um, personal device. And the new concept is patient-performed ultrasound. Question is, could you have a patient who has a recurrent kidney stones, can they scan themselves to see if they have hydro or not? Can they send the picture to somebody after they scan? Or can they scan beelines themselves and send the picture to somebody so they don't have to come to the ED over and over? Is this something um, which could be done in future? Um, but my friend here, Al, is going to comment a lot, and he's going to critique a lot about all these features over here, right? He's going to say image quality is not there, archiving is not good, it's going to, it's going to break all the HIPAA rules, and uh, you're not going to get paid for what. But I will tell you, like, in the six or seven years ago, or even maybe a little longer than that, so we were in the same position with the card-based systems. Vendors are competing with each other to make the devices better. So it's inevitable. It's going to happen, right? Technology is getting better. Uh, they're going to get more compact, and they're going to get wireless, and more. Uh, and then if it comes to disinfection, same concept, right? So you're going to sit in your dark box while you're, you have it, something to clean. You're going to scan and come back and put it over there, and it'll be clean, right? So it is going to evolve. We have to agree that it's already disrupting. The handheld devices are already disrupting the point of care ultrasound world. So it's only a matter of time when the AI is integrated into handheld devices, then, you know, qualitatively or quantitatively, you are going to get the measurements. And I think that is going to make a big difference in terms of, you know, diagnostic certainty, uh, improving efficiency, workflow, and so on. So I'm going to close out with these two slides. It's, uh, the future is already here, so you better get used to it. And it's everybody, everywhere, that's what's going to be pretty soon. With that, I'm going to close out, and uh, Al is going to come over. Well, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. Uh, Chikar, you did a very good presentation, but I think that I'm actually right here like uh, trying to hold your horses a little bit because I think that you're going too fast, okay? So um, the real question that we're trying to answer right now is should handheld ultrasounds replace card-based systems, you know? And while I think that there's a good amount of evidence that's starting to grow, I don't think that we're there yet, okay? So hold your horses. I know you where you're at. I actually put you in a, in a specific region right there for a reason, okay? I wish I had, uh, I have to say I had no disclosures. I just wish I had. So if actually you see a bunch of companies here, I'm asking for compensation later. So don't say that, okay? So um, why are we even discussing this right now? Right? Well, let's start with that. So back in the 80s, you know, this is what we had. How many of you actually uh, scanned with this? Because I did, right? And then something happened and we had that, right? We have a very small portal system and then out of there, all these portal systems are coming in, coming in quicker, quicker, faster, right? We continue moving, 2014, 15, you know, more, hand, more smaller system coming into the emergency department being used. And that actually brings us to now, right? This is what we have right now. So I'm glad that you actually put all the uh, systems that I was actually going to talk about a little bit. Um, there are too many th systems that are handhelds right now. And they all have good things, they all have bad things. You just need to know how you're going to be using them and when you're going to be using them. But can these handhelds really replace the base system? Well, to answer that question, I guess we're going to have to ask the expert again and try to go with some of the literature. So I actually really tried to answer this question and I looked for a bunch of papers. I was going to drill the paper master. There was no way I could, right? So I went back to what I know. This is actually a policy statement, okay? This is actually taken from ASAP. So what I did is I break it down a little bit so we can actually go through some of the th these things that we have there. So. Look at what it says in actually in two, right? Um, if the physician wishes to purchase a system, right, it has to basically go and intend to uh, the services you're going to be doing, and you have to know how you're going to be using that system, right? Now, the question that you might ask yourself in your institution, who owns your imaging in your institution? 
Because if you actually just go ahead and, yeah, all ultrasound for the masses, and you go and buy all these ultrasounds and you put them in the ER, well, you might be violating some of your own bylaws. So this idea of you getting all these images and you start using them in the ER, that might not work, okay? Not only that, if you actually also go and, you know, you brought about what application you're gonna be using it and how you're gonna be using it. Now, that billing component that you were basically talking about might also be affected because if you are gonna try to bill for those images that you're getting from the ultrasound systems, you need to know if that machine is actually owned by the, uh, the, the hospital or yours. And that can actually create another issue there. So, whoops. Yes, I forgot about that. So, um, the last thing I was gonna talk about, specifically in this paper, uh, is basically the use of, uh, uh, for these systems, right? Um, oops. I went too back. Okay, so the use of these systems, right? So when you're using these systems, you also have to be using whatever cleaning guidelines you're gonna be using uh, in, your, in your institution. And those cleaning guidelines basically um, might affect how you actually are carrying those systems. So from those of you that actually have used the system, it's great because you can go to the, uh, to the bedside, use the machine in the bedside, but what's the major hindrance that you have? Well, you use the system, and then you finish with the system, and are you carrying something on your hand also to clean the machine, or you still have to go outside and try to clean the machines or clean the system, right? So the majority of you are gonna be putting that where? In your pockets? Or if you're really intuitive, you might just put it around your neck, right? Um, and that actually brings another connotation, right? If you're gonna put that around your neck, that's the same system you're gonna be using later to talk to your family and your family members or somebody else. So the question is, what about infections? Is there any concern that this system might be like a source of infection in your, in your emergency department, right? Now, I hate to do this, but we have a wonderful conversation last year about stethoscopes and all this other stuff. But if you're gonna be using these handheld devices like they're part of what you normally carry, this is also gonna apply to it, right? So what are the organisms that you're gonna be affecting yourself with? You know, negative staph, staph aureus, acetobacter, and uh, enterobacter, right? So those things are still there, and you can actually continue having them. And even when you actually clean them, right, there's this study, basically 45% uh, clean the stethoscope just annually, and while I think that we're gonna be cleaning our uh, systems a little better, hopefully we are, um, you're still gonna carry those in your hands and you're not gonna really give the time for whatever you're gonna be cleaning the, the probe to actually be in effect. So this is another study, you know, the, uh, the use of uh, ultrasound probe in infection control, okay, some of the challenges. And they basically went through all the data and they actually got a bunch of other studies here and, and basically they summarize here is basically you have, you have uh, concerns that you can actually be colonized with all these things and if you don't clean those well, you can actually get somebody else infected, right? That's kind of the bottom line and there's basically just four studies. They show that even when you're actually carrying those probes, you actually clean them, you still can actually cause some issues there, okay? Uh, what about, you know, for, uh, this is another study here, so 60% of transabdominal uh, uh, probes, they have contamination uh, after an ultrasound examination. And even with low uh, disinfection, you know, 4% of those are still gonna have some type of contaminant with it, okay? So you're still basically carrying something that you can actually infect other patients with you. Now I go back to, again, this is actually a consensus statement. This is basically what we're using. I'm not taking anything out of the ordinary here to like, prove my point here. So let's actually talk about um, the systems here. Now, when you're talking about ultrasound, um, you are talking also about the examination, the clinical examination, you are trying to make sure that you're not saying that this is part of your physical examination. Unfortunately, all the studies that basically she could just talk about, even in medical students, what they basically are saying is this, popping out everywhere, you know, this is part of the physical exam, this is part of the ultrasound, why would I actually even pay for that? There's no reason for it. This portable, portable ultrasound systems, what they're basically doing is that they are basically making this so affordable that they want you to integrate it with your physical exam. And that's not the right answer that we are trying to like, give to the population, right? 
This is another action that you want to use for taking care of your patients. Okay? So again, more data, more data coming out of there. Also, if you perform using those pocket devices, you know, you need to make sure that there is some quality to the diagnosis. And I have to be honest with you, as machines actually have started to go smaller, you know that the quality of the, of the images is, is, is being improving, right? We know that. But the real answer is, is the image quality enough to actually do more on those systems or not? So you go out and see a patient, a patient comes with shortness of breath, you decide to do the ultrasound, this is what you find, right? Well, everybody, I'm, I'm hoping that everybody here knows what that is because otherwise I'm wasting my time, right? Um, but you actually compare that to the, to the, uh, the actual base system and, and you can definitely see that there's a lot of difference there in, in the image quality, right? You can actually see this is a little more disorganized. Now, here these two for the own personal view, they were excellent, right? But when you start thinking at the subsidiary view, it might not even be the same thing. You can actually see way better how this, you know, you can even see the liver better than you're doing here. You see everything, you see that, that right ventricle uh, being contracted and basically collapsed there. And even for the apical four chamber view, here you can actually even see that there's a little bit of collapse of the right atrium down here. Well, you cannot barely see anything in, in this view, right? So while you are getting the whole picture, you're still missing some stuff, right? Now, I actually put echo, cardiac echo, on purpose because if you actually do that literature search that uh, um, Shrikar told you about, the majority of the studies have been done on bedside echo, okay, by cardiologists. Okay, how do you use that at the bedside? And yeah, there's a, a good amount of data that says that, yeah, it's good to use, okay? But how important is quality when you're actually uh, trying to check that? There's really not a lot of literature about here, so if anybody wants to actually create a paper on this, probably this is a good area uh, for, for um, handheld systems. So the only thing I was able to find was actually a paper from Blybus. I think I, I wouldn't be talking here if Blybus didn't appear in some type of paper form here. So um, they actually uh, put a bunch of studies. They actually took out the, uh, the ultrasounds, and they basically did one with a point of care ultrasound, one of the, the, the actual car base, and they compared them, right? They gave them like a system. They basically took the image. They gave it to a third person. They actually review it, and they gave them a scoring system. Now, they actually found that resolution and the image quality was less um, compared to the car based systems. But they couldn't really say if there was any difference because the details were still there, right? So that was actually kind of like one of the things that I kind of took out of this. Now, this is another study that actually talks about uh, cardiac echoes specifically. And they basically took a bunch of, uh, of papers and they reviewed it, right? And you can actually see that depending on what you actually be looking for, uh, there's data that supports it or not, right? So if you're thinking about uh, pericardial fusions, the data is excellent, right? There's no questions about that. But if you're actually talking about inferior vena cava, it's very variable. So how is it going to be used in that system? Is that system going to be used for a one-stop shop for everything, or is it going to be something that you have to grow on to, into it? Okay? The same thing here. This is actually another study for uh, on outpatient cardiology. And, and here, basically, they use the uh, systems inside, outside uh, for in the handheld devices, 4% of the major findings were missed. Now, if you tell me that 4% is, uh, is appropriate to miss in anything, I, I think that the lawyers are not going to be happy with you, right? So depending on what else you're going to be using the system also is going to give you a, a difference there, okay? Now, this is another study for pocket devices uh, in short-term training, okay, for accuracy and efficiency. And uh, we're actually now talking about cholelithiasis. So you would say, well, in cardiac, it seems that there's evidence that we should be using it. But what about for cholelithiasis? Well, they actually did this study. It's internal medicine and uh, emergency medicine. But internal medicine residents, um, there was two special uh, people that actually had uh, experience with ultrasound. And they actually did 146 patients. They actually did ultrasounds, uh, official ultrasounds, comprehensives, and uh, ultrasound at the bedside, right? So they found that the sensitivity for, uh, respectively, for the uh, uh, operators was, depending for cholelithiasis, was pretty good. It was 93%, okay? And the specificity was actually pretty good compared to the non-experts uh, that they were also doing ultrasounds, that it was about 75%.
So what this actually tell me is in the hands of somebody that has experience, this actually might make a huge difference. But for somebody that doesn't really have a lot of experience, they might actually miss stuff. And specifically, the things that they were misdiagnosed were probably sludge and microlithiasis. And that actually probably has to do with what? Image quality. Because they might actually think that this was actually something else. OK? Um, this is another study for ultrasound machines, diagnostic, uh, time recording, based of the ultrasound system. 28 uh, patients basically taken from internal medicine. They basically did a, a bunch of studies also again. And now in this system, uh, in this study, um, they actually found about 113 pathologic ultrasound findings. And with the handheld devices, they were only able to get 82. That's a huge difference on about the things of pathological uh, findings you're looking for. Now, granted, a lot of the things were like contour of the liver, measurements, you know, that might not be as much for emergency medicine, but can this actually replace the car-based system? Probably not, okay? And this is actually probably the best study that, that is out there right now. Uh, this is actually 2017, okay? Um, and what they did here is that they actually used ultrasound, uh, point of care ultrasound, in uh, different um, um, applications. Abdominal, including cholithiasis, uh, kind of retroperitoneal, looking at the kidneys, and specifically for obstetrical. And here the findings are a little more concerning because they actually were able to say that there's a pretty good sensitivity when you're actually looking, comparing it to the actual uh, comprehensive study. But when you're actually looking at specifics, it breaks it down that it's too much of a wide difference. Not only that, they actually uh, kind of gave numbers to the quality of all those images they were taking, and they basically sent it somebody else to reply. And they found that if the image quality was less than a three, you know, they were really off. So quality does make a difference when you're actually trying to make the diagnosis in specific systems, right? So these are the, five th the four things that they basically broke down that actually would make a difference when you're actually doing point of care ultrasound. Image quality, the technical limitations of the device, the practitioner experience, and the expertise of the user and the reader, okay? The expectations, because if you actually do have an expectation you're going to be getting something, but you're not really prepared for it, you might not be able to take it. So the reality after we have said all of this, Tricard, and answering your question, is that there's still too many questions. Can actually we can say that this is going to replace a car system? Well, maybe in 40 or 50 years, maybe there you are right. There might be a, a, a way that the image quality is going to be so better that you can actually say that. But right now, while we actually have all these applications, we don't know if this point of care ultrasound systems or handheld systems can actually do all of this. Okay. So being said that, we still cannot say that we're going to just ditch the, uh, the uh, ultrasound system. So probably having those two together might actually be better and basically just joining hands together to make sure that this is what we do better for the patients. Okay? Questions? Concerns? Preguntas? Well, I actually was going to say that for the last three years we have done this, and every time that we have done, I have always put something about ultrasound with either Avengers or even for Captain America, and it's always this time of the year. So. Thank you so much for uh, your attention. Um, if you guys want to talk more, I, I know that we have some more time. If there's any questions, concerns about anything that we just discussed. Actually, uh, I love the uh, whatever Jason mentioned. I changed my vote to use contrast. Actually, after this talk, the reason that part of application, I think, I, uh, Dan has been spoiled with all the good machine that is available here. If you go in Africa, we've been doing this with uh, the last couple of years, and you were there. All we have is handheld ultrasound, and it's really a lot of time we need to answer. And I have nothing else. No CT scan, no even X-ray, nothing. And agree that we maybe put some other priority like water. But honestly, that was my mindset when I walked there. But now I'm just looking for any resources I can get to just put the ultrasound because I know I see how beneficial is this to what I do. So if we don't have really good ultrasound machine, they don't have access to that high quality, that we've been spoiled, and we are getting it all the time. 
So that's the really role for contrast. And I'm going to use it. So if you want to fix it, if he's expensive 100, agree. Let's just help it to get this expensive less. Let's get the cost less. Let this more available for the real application. So if we define it as a real application, I think that's one of the greatest things we can do for the handheld auto science. Joining these two talk together, I think it's going to help a lot. Just to respond to something Dan had said, for all of you research nerds out there or basic science researchers, apparently swine models have a different complement system. So the lipid shell. <laughs> no, 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 this is actually cool that I learned. So the lipid shell actually induces a widespread complement uh, activation and release in the swine model. So most of, except the very early contrast studies, all use uh, rat and mouse models. Just as FYI. <laughs> I just, I'm just going to conclude by saying the whole point of this really isn't to persuade you one way or the other. It's so that you're armed with the thoughts when you go back to your institution. So you want to employ contrast? Well, you better be ready to answer these questions. Um, and he's right. The, um, I was told that if you give pigs into methicin, they don't die when you give them the stuff. And I personally have been injected with the contrast, and I'm still here. So there you go. Uh, but in all reality, that's the whole point of these arguments is so that you enhance your um, or you increase how well informed you are when you go to push these things. Because I think there is a role for this in a research setting, um, certainly in uh, austere environments. But you have to be able to answer to the naysayers. Same thing with handheld. You have to be able to answer to the naysayers. And I actually think handheld is, I think you're right, the future is here. It's, 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 it's out of the barn. So. Yeah, and I just want to highlight that there is that ASAP handheld ultrasound uh, policy out there. That was there because of an incident that occurred. Uh, and even health systems don't know how to handle the introduction of systems that are taking pictures that they believe traditionally belongs to them and sending it to a cloud or even keeping it on the actual device itself. These are all real issues. So I urge you and I, I want to say caution you before you go out there and start purchasing one of these and using it. I know where Sarah went, but um, you work these issues out. Um, have something down, some agreement, um, or you may get in trouble that you, know, you weren't anticipating. And over the last several years, we've tried to pick topics that are either very common or up and coming to sort of provide you, like we all talked about, those different viewpoints so that when you go back to argue for things or someone comes at you to challenge you from your institution, you have those different points of view and you can argue, the, you can answer their concerns and you can bring up those points. So if you guys have ideas or things that you want covered for next year, email Chris. <laughs> He's in charge.